Hello YouTubers, it's Steve here, aka Catanonia, and welcome to another video on air gunology. Now this video is a little bit different. Um, I recently went to the Day State 40th uh, year anniversary, and they did a lot of presentations on there, as well as the Genus Day State Genus, uh, which is the Huntsman Regal that they're launching 2019 limited edition, and the ASP program. I'll leave links to that video. Can't never remember which side is up here. Uh, but also. Uh, um, Tony Beelis, who really many people see as the face of Daystate, um, gave a presentation on the history of Daystate, how it started in 1978 to where it became today in 2018. And I personally found that video very, uh, th that presentation very, very interesting. So I was luckily I recorded it all and I managed to get off the original slides and videos that went along with that presentation. So I thought I'd throw them together uh, for you to have a look at it as well. Now the camera quality quality is not that great, that's just me. I wasn't really planning on doing this and I'm just using cheapish camera equipment on there. And the uh, presentation does go on for about 30 minutes because Tony does like to talk. But uh, yeah, bear with it, it's really, really interesting. And um, I'll tell you what, let's just uh, run the intro and we'll go straight into it. Thank you very much. So Daystate, the name was picked from a list of pre-established companies. So in the old days, in the 70s, you could either think of a name yourself or you could pick something from a list. And that's pretty much how the name came about. But the, the company slightly goes before the name itself. So it's 40 years birthday this year, actually 23rd of October. And we're going to be running on celebrating this event for the next sort of 12 months. So we're going to string it out a little bit. <laughs> Um, but we've bought a collection of guns for you to look at and talk through and take it through. But I'm going to go through here how the company was founded and uh, some of the, the milestones along the way. Uh, really, the company was founded around a gentleman called Don Lowndes. And Don was a pretty interesting character. We have a couple of his uh, successors here. Uh, we have his grandson, uh, Richard. And uh, from them, and from other anecdotal stories, we've been able to piece together for you what actually happened. It's quite difficult to find because this is no history books, and it's been a sort of a labour of love of a few of us to find out what the history of Day State was. So there may be mistakes, and we may get a few things in the wrong order. We may simplify things to protect the innocent. But, uh, but generally, this is what happened. So Don was uh, a gentleman, he was a bare-knuckle boxer, he was known as the fighting blacksmith, he was uh, into conservation, and he was into air guns. He had many, many things that he did, racing cars, racing motorcycles, he was in the army, there was lots of different strings to don. And as he got older, he decided that um, deer farming was something that he was going to have a go at. He wasn't doing it for the meat, he was doing it to breed um, the deer to sell to other reserves and different areas and he was involved with Whipsnade Zoo at some point and he had a small uh, head of deer and uh, one day Don was on his farm I think it was Riddings farm and a, uh, a deer got snagged a plastic bag on his ankles and this put the deer into really into a sort of a sad state it started going nuts and there was nothing they could do with this deer, and it had to be shot and killed. It was quite distressing to see a beautiful animal killed for nothing. So he looked around for an effective tranquilized gun, and unable to find one, he decided to build his own. We have a small clip to introduce the gentleman himself. Now, uh, this is interesting. My colleague Gareth at the back there, he was tasked with four hours of watching VHS videos from the Don Lowndes estate, most of which have been overtaped with Emmerdale Farm. <laughs> yeah. But one, one minute 40 snippet was found to be on one of the tapes, and I'd just like to play that for you. Down for space. They're going to be in picture books only. There's going to be nothing left. There's, no, there's going to be no rhino. There's going to be no elephant. And poor old Jumbo is the 
He said, no, she's standing in the, in the jungle. The tranquilizer gun is made at Don Lowndes factory at Stone in Staffordshire. It was invented there. It uses compressed air to fire a dart which contains a powerful drug. Don Lowndes was invited to Kenya to try out the gun on the endangered animals. You can see the adrenaline's going because you know that they're very close. You can't actually see them. You can hear the sticks cracking. You can, you can feel them breathing. You can actually tell that they're breathing just behind the bush, but you can't see them. And you've got to get in a position to get that dart in the right place. And when you do, then you've got to get out of the way pretty quick. Because an elephant can run for up to two miles before it falls unconscious. Don Lowndes is working on inventing a radio dart so the animal can be tracked and traced. He's also trying to raise money to equip Kenyan rangers with a spotter plane and the right firearms to frighten the poachers. They have really security there. They have security and the, the chap is the African blacks and they've only got bows and arrows and they are facing the poachers with the machine guns. The rhino man of the Midlands has developed a successful business saving animals by shooting them. His next target, £100,000 for the World Wildlife Fund. There we go, a little bit of an introduction to the man himself. Um, so he, Don, this, these, this video was taken, I suppose, about uh, 10 years really after it, the events, the initial events we're talking about. And what he did was he started to make a few tranquilizer guns basically based on the Sheridan pump-up rifle. The Sheridan Blue Streak in particular was used as the base rifle. And he started making his own tranquilizer rifle based on the Sheridan. And indeed he did an air gun version. And we have one here somewhere in our collection at the back of uh, what we call the prototype gun, the gun number one. And that is clearly a Sheridan-based rifle uh, where you pump the fore end, I think about five or six strokes to get it up to a reasonable amount of power and uh, load your single pellet and off you go. And the tranquilizer gun version of this uh, was usually called the sportsman. And the slide here shows um, a, a tranquilizer sportsman and the air rifle version of the sportsman. Now, Don really did these himself, but he had a tendency to use uh, skilled people wherever he found them. He seemed to be a very convincing character. And so he was uh, going around finding people who could really work for him, making these parts. And then he was the salesman. But he was the catalyst that pulled it really together. More than the gunsmith, though he had the skills to do it. Uh, and he started to look around to see what he could do. And he went to a number of people to see if he could get investment. He went to a number of people to see if he could get their involvement. And one of these companies was a, basically a scaffolding type of company, and they formed a company called Daystate, and there was a share from it. This is the late 70s, um, building trade was in turmoil, and the scaffolding company went into recession, and they, uh, decided, the bank were called in a couple of advisors. And these advisors were a gentleman called Kim Gibbon and Mike Seddon. And they were called in to have a look at this failing scaffolding company and they decided there was nothing they could do about it. But what's this share they found in the drawer with the word day state on it? And they had a look at that and they decided to invest in it. They invested it, they built a factory and the factory was in stone in Staffordshire. All the time they were putting together uh, more development rifles. They matched up with a guy called Joe Wilkes, Wilkins, and also uh, his young son, Steve Wilkins, and they were working on an air system which went underneath the, um, you know, the, the barrel, possibly based on a Japanese design, but they were able to use the air cylinders they were getting from um, Ken and Mike to create a, another rifle which they called the Day State Huntsman. And the picture here is an interesting one because they were also doing a tranquilizer gun version and they had the tranquilizer huntsmans and the air huntsmans and uh, this is a picture of a tranquilizer base with an air gun top so it's a hybrid between the two 
Whether they were all made that way, we don't know, because this is the only one we've ever seen. And we've got it here for you to have a look at. But they were certainly developing, still keeping going on the tranquilizing, which I think was probably by this point Don's main interest, while the air gun side was being more developed at the factory in stone to, for a commercial application. The original logo was a dart sticking out of the uh, crosshair, but that was soon developed as we joined Europe um, with stars around the outside and the more familiar logo that you see today was born. But the initial one was a dart sticking out logo, and you do come across collection rifles with a, uh, a dart still on the breech block. Well, the LR-90s were done with the dart at the side. Here is the factory in Newcastle Street in Stoke. It's still there today. It's opposite the car wash where we get our cars clean. And it's uh, now up for rent if somebody wants to reopen it. Uh, and it was part of the Jules Brewery. As the Jules Brewery moved out of stone, the uh, company moved in and it had a factory behind. This is the road side that runs up Newcastle Street into Stone and Staffordshire. And on the other side, the far side you can't see, is the canal. The loft area you can see was where they had uh, ranges and they had a small target frame in there where they were able to test rifles at short range and including the tranquilizer guns. In fact there's a story of uh, testing a tranquilizer gun where they were firing at a screen and the dart hit the frame, ricocheted straight through the window and straight out over onto the canal. And when they went down to the canal to see what had happened they found the dart sticking out of the side of a canal barge. So they had to wait until it was dark to creep out there and go and get their dart back. Rifles are being developed in stone, and you can see here a couple of examples. The original rifles had a stainless steel air tube, but we think by the time they got to gun number 50, might have been later, uh, they were starting to make them in brass tubes. The story on this is that the manufacturer of the stainless steel tube said, this is ruining my tools, I'm not making any more. So they decided to make them in brass. So there was a change from stainless steel to brass. Otherwise, the guns made pretty much, remain pretty much the same. And we're talking now of around about the mid 80s. And in mid, the mid 1980s, they started to get interested in making higher volumes. Don, by this time, had pretty much retired back to the farm and was still pursuing his dreams on tranquilizing guns and actually was starting to go abroad and um, do demonstrations on the tranquilizer rifles abroad. But his involvement in the day-to-day -day running a day set by this point was pretty minimal. Uh, the company was running as a manufacturing company of its own. One of the simplifications they did was to make the Huntsman out of one piece tube. And this is now known as the Huntsman Mark I. And I think this is, now we're talking mid 85, 86, 87. Uh, I think this is where a lot of us kind of got to know the day state story. Because uh, you have to be getting on a bit to remember stuff that happened in the sort of early 70s and being around. So generally, about the 80s, is uh, where most of us came into the story. And I think, looking at the crowd here, I think we've got a lot of 80s children here with air guns, big kids with air guns. And we would have had the uh, guns from the 1980s. And so the Huntsman Mark I is bread and butter. I can certainly remember reading uh, Terry Doe, who's here somewhere, uh, doing a review on a Huntsman Mark I in a bed and bullpup stock. But it wasn't for uh, Airgun World, was it, Terry? It was for some other rag. I can't remember which one it was. Uh... Well, you like rags, thank you. <laughs> <laughs> uh, so it, uh, a lot of us have been involved in the Huntsman Mark I. And the Huntsman Mark I was a simplification of the original Huntsman, which was an expensive rifle to produce. And uh, the first of these rifles started to be used in the blossoming sport of field target shooting. And this particular version is the Huntsman Field Target Rifle Custom, Huntsman FTR Custom. And this had this beautiful stock. The very first ones had that, what I call a Queen Anne front, from like a Queen Anne chair. Later on, they, they slipped that down to snorkel. And this really was the first match-winning rifle 
in field target, when field target started to use uh, pre-charged air rifles. I remember the story at the time with uh, pre-charged air rifles was that uh, Ken was trawling them around the shops, trying to get them to buy them, and they were told uh, it's, they were 250 pounds at a time when a Varark HW77 would cost you 80 pounds a you. And they would say, they're how much? And you need what to fill them? <laughs> Go away. Air bottle, pumps, 250 pound gun, nobody was interested. And then a gentleman named Barry McClaw started to win every field target match with one of these rifles. And they asked the same question. They're how much and what do you need to fill them? Uh, it was, uh, once you start to win, the uh, emphasis got changed. And this is the rifle that took it forward and really got put day state on the map. And it also spurned some clones, uh, noticeably the Air Arms Chamel was by this point Air Arms had noticed that Day State were doing very well with their pre-charge and felt they wanted to get in on the act. And Air Arms then joined the party and started doing the, first of all, the Air Arms Jamal and then later on the NJL. But Day State had more sort of strings to its bow than just air guns, so it did allow itself to diversify into other products. And two of the products it went into was paintball, which at that point was mostly CO2. And they say pioneered the air system really for paintball guns. First of all in an English caliber, and then later on in the American, I think it's 680 caliber. And they did several uh, paintball markers, as they're known, and two of them are on screen. The Sam Patriot, which is the first one, and later a, a paintball marker called the TFX 2000s. And we have, I think, a Sam Patriot here behind for you to have a look at. Top left is, or top right for you, is the, uh, sorry, top left for you, is the um, Excalibur. And this is a five shot uh, propellant power, so not an air gun for once. And this was a contract with a company for ML Lifeguard who commissioned AC to design a multi-shot riot gun. Originally they were called um, non-lethal, and then when a few people got killed by accidents, they became known as less lethal. Yeah. <laughs> and that term has stuck and is still used to this day. And these less lethal guns were very crude, a five shot rubber bullet gun that basically blasted you off your feet if you got too close, and if you were still standing, you fired a few more times until eventually they fell over. Uh, yes? Do you remember us test firing one of those? Yes, Derek, I do remember you test firing one, hitting a cow, I remember. Yeah. <laughs> <laughs> yeah. With smoke, it wasn't a rubber bullet. Yeah. Yeah. And so we've got, uh, the Excalibur was put into production Day State, and Day State felt that it was going to make its fortune with this rifle, but it wasn't to be. The world market moved away. So it went back to air guns. And two of the air guns we went back to was a lightweight version of the Huntsman, called the Huntsman Mark II. One of the more interesting things was that the crossover of the Mark II was gradual, so you do find Mark I bases and Mark II breech blocks, etc. No parts get wasted. Uh, and then they did a lightweight version called the LR90. There had been an attempt to make a lightweight rifle early on in Dave State's career, mostly for Ken who needed a lightweight rifle to shoot with, so a few handmade ones were made, and we have one of those at the back. But the LR90 was the production version, using an inch tube. And it was probably the most successful inch tube gun that Dave State's ever been involved with. Generally, inch tube guns don't sell, uh, but this one did. Now we're getting into, for me, what's the modern era. Uh, the top rifle is a rifle called a Daystate 2000, and this is Daystate pioneering air regulators. Uh, in 1992, they called the Daystate 2000, and this is an air reservoir gun, uh, air reservoir with a regulator. And they went to a consultancy firm who did regulators for the fire brigade, and they helped the, this company helped them to design regulators. But actual fact, it ended up being reversed. They ended up designing the regulators for the fire brigade company because they couldn't get it right. So they ended up with a fantastic regulator in the Daystate 2000. That was the first regulated guns, really, commercially. Air Arms had, had done a couple in 87, 88, and then Daystate did its own version in 92. Below that is the Daystate Mirage, a super lightweight gun using extruded aluminium air cylinder 
that I seem to remember was £10 per inch in cost, and that's in 1990. And the, the Mirage was a light, even lightweight version of the LR90, which is LR lightweight rifle. And the, we have a Mirage at the back with its aluminium tube. It had a tendency to zero shift, uh, and the factory was nicknamed the Meringue because it used to bend so much. But, uh, but when they were good, they were extremely good rifles, but it, it didn't stay in production for too long. At this point, the factory had moved from its premises in Newcastle Street and had moved to Birch House Lane. The company had been uh, basically sold to a gentleman called Gary Saunders, and he, with his row engineering company that had made parts for Daystate, um, brought it into the building in Birch House Lane. And there was a four acre site, and the buildings were built, and there was a purpose built factory for Day State that wove in and out of the row engineering factory, which made the parts. So for once, the parts were all made pretty much in the same premises. Uh, and the pictures show uh, progression. The uh, bottom right picture shows the factory entrance. Uh, bottom left shows the Mark III, the electronic rifles, which were now just becoming into, into production. And development with David Snook and Steve Harper allowed Day State to develop the electronic rifles. And the top picture is an interesting picture, and it shows what Day State had to do when it was shipping to Air Guns of Arizona. Because there wasn't room in the factory for the shipments by this point, so they had to assemble the shipments in the car park. And if the lorry didn't turn up or it rained, they had to disassemble and take it back in again until the lorry came back up. So they were desperately short of space even by this point. Other rifles of note is the uh, Air Ranger. So with the bottom rifle is the prototype Air Ranger with a laminate stock. By this time, they say had matched up with uh, Stockmeister Gary Kane, and he developed the stock for the Air Ranger. Uh, top is an interesting version of the Air Ranger called the Air Ranger Extreme, which was an 80 foot pound uh, 2 2 caliber air rifle, um, precharged air rifle, and 80 foot pounds, not that common in 2 2, and they, yet they were doing that in sort of by now, sort of 2003, 2004. And the uh, Air Ranger 80 was a very interesting gun. The first prototype one I remember had a problem with a bre breech bolt, so they had to upgrade the breech bolt to 2 5 standard after one of the prototypes shot the breech bolt over the shoulder, uh, firer's shoulder and into the tree behind. So then maybe we need to beef that bit up a little bit. The power was so extreme. So the development of that was quite interesting. The Air Range is worth the note, and it brought a lot of export sales to Day State and got uh, really Day State recognized on the international stage. Around the same time, we tied up with two Airgram maestros uh, from the trade, Steve Harper on the left and David Snook on the right. And they had, in uh, 1994, developed an air pistol which used electronic firing system. I, at the time, I was writing for um, Shooting Sports magazine. Have we got any shooting sports people here? And uh, there we are. There we are. Blood, so remaining victim. Yeah, there we are. <laughs> and I, I did an article on the Wolf pistol, classic Wolf pistol, and I was amazed by this piece of electronics. But it wasn't commercially available. There wasn't too many of them about. You had to individually order them. And the company that made them was very cottage and very small. So it was pretty well unknown. Um, but in 2002, uh, just by pure luck, we managed to tie in with uh, Steve Harper and David Snook. And they developed the first electronic air rifles for Daystate. Initially, they grafted on uh, Wolf Electronics into a, an existing day state rifle called the XL, uh, XS, and uh, this little rifle that did a remarkable 23 shots in 177 with the electronics grafted on went to 94 shots um, in 177. So that was quite a, an eye opener, and that rifle was developed further. The initial electronics were not very stable, there was a little bit of variance as the gun fired. So to compensate for that, Daystate engineered in one of its paintball regulators, one of its Airstream regulators taken from its paintball technology, and stuck that into its then Mark III rifle. And here's a cutaway showing you how it worked. 
And you can see that there's two reasons that the regulator went in from underneath. One was serviceability, and perhaps the other reason was that we were using parts that we already had from paper, and that's where it had to go. You can see here, pretty interesting, the early, this is the very early gun, and you can see the striker on a metal former, which was later changed to plastic to reduce weight, and you can see the secondary valve, and the two batteries that had to be separated to get in the stock around the regulator, which was now conveniently in the wrong place. Nice bit of graphic there. <laughs> You've got two more day state rifles, the Mark III, which is the B-type. Uh, the original A-type versions were made for UK market, and that was developed to a much more uh, exciting version for the overseas market, which had programmability, uh, 16 power settings, magazine counters. They were all built into these early rifles in 2003. And uh, we developed an Air Wolf version, that is uh, an Air Ranger, with electronics stuck on it, we call it the Air Wolf. Wolf in homage of the Harper Wolf rifle that we originally sort of mimicked. And the Wolf rifle really, the Air Wolf rifle took Day State on export really to a new level. It started to really sell in exports. So much so that it started to actually make quite a bit of money. The next development was an uh, interesting one in 2007, where uh, in 2003 we had been working on a, a air regulator which was electronically controlled. But they were originally hand mapped. So you fired the rifle, bang, you then turned the power up to 11 and a half pounds, you wrote down the settings, and then you fired it again, bang. You turned the power up to 11 and a half pounds you wrote down the settings. And after you've done that a couple of hundred times, you then had a map. So you could program the gun at a certain pressure, it fired at this, and second pressure, it fired at this, and so on. And in 2003, we were doing guns by hand. It took about two weeks to do a gun. But it, it proved the concept of mapping each shot at each power. You then had to find a way of doing it commercially because you don't sell many guns when it takes two weeks to set one up. So it was then worked on over the preceding months and years as a bit of a hobby project. But by 2007, we had it cracked. We had a programmer, we had a program where we were able to put the map in and the programmer was able to read the program. We put a pressure sensor in the gun by this point, which was stolen from a car engine and then later acquired, and we were able to read the air cylinder pressure to two decimal places. And from that, we were able to automate the map, and we put it into two rifles in 2007, uh, an MVT and an MCT. MVT stands for Map uh, Velocity Technology, and MCT is Map Compensated Technology. They came out at the same time, and we thought the velocity one was going to be the way to go. And on the velocity one, we had a chronograph built in the muzzle. So as the pellet exited the barrel, the chronograph read the speed of the pellet and it corrected the uh, microprocessor at the back. So it had a map in there, but it was corrected on every shot. But it's only as good as the pellets. And it would tend to hunt one way or the other. And lead dust would also cause us problems. And we spent a good couple of years chasing those things around the country and they used to come back a lot. So, uh, by, the, by the end of 2008, 2009, we'd pretty much decided that MVT needed a lot more development and we carried developing the MCT process. And 2008 really onwards was the time we developed the MCT, where we didn't need the chronograph. The company hadn't forgotten about its uh, tranquilizer gun basis, and you can see here are the last two tranquilizer guns really made by Daystate. Top left is an Air Ranger Mark II, which is a mechanical tranquilizer gun, uses a plunger and pistol assembly, uh, using a chassis really from a QC2. But we were able to keep parts from that and make them on for 10 years after the air gun had pretty much gone. We carried on making the Air Ranger Mark II. And just as we were finishing the Air Ranger series and had run out of breech blocks, uh, we had a massive order in from DEFRA for a new tranquilizer gun. So we developed uh, two versions 
of the new tranquilizer gun. One was based uh, on an X2, and the other one was based on an Airwolf. The X2 version was developed in Holland by Alfred de Vries, who's our Dutch importer, and I remember him sending a prototype across of me on the outside range with a testing it for the first time. And I loaded the dart, and I was going to shoot the dart at the target, but the target had a metal backdrop. And I thought, hmm, that's a bit dangerous because it might hit the backdrop and damage the dart. So I turned around and there was a bonfire 70 yards in the other direction, which had a satellite full of boxes. And I thought, right, if I fire at the boxes, I can recover my dart undamaged and test this rifle. So I fired at the boxes and there was a huge bang and a whizzing noise and the dart disappeared over the boxes, over the hedge, into the herd of cows bar on, beyond. Same herd of cows that Derek shot at with me. <laughs> so I rang him up from the car park and said, um, it's a little bit too powerful. The idea is to stun the animal, not blast a hole straight through it. And he said, ah, oh, Tony in his Dutch accent, you need to use the low power spring. What spring has it got in it? I said, the spring it came in with the gun. Ah, he said, that is the low power spring. <laughs> So we then developed a second version, which was the Airwolf, where we were able to turn the power down electronically. And we have one of those on the table behind you. You can have a look at that. The tranquilizer guns do somewhere between 80 and 150, 180 foot-pounds at a push. So there's a fair bit of energy in them. They're using a 13 millimeter barrel. So there's a little bit of air space for the, um, for the air to expand into. And the darts are heavy. So you get a lot of energy from that as well. So you do not want to be hit by one of these. You can certainly shoot them. Uh, the, the small ones, the early ones, would shoot 40, 50 yards. But the later ones, such as this uh, Sandman, as we named it, uh, will shoot up to about 80 yards. And you certainly were able to hit objects 80 yards away. You can hit a cow, anyway, when you hit 80 yards. Uh, darting with tranquilizer guns is also a pretty exciting sport. I do recommend it to everybody. You have to track an animal through mud and slime in your wellies with a tranquilizer gun, knowing that when you've shot it, it's likely to come after you for several minutes until the drugs take effect. You can't use too much drugs because you kill the animal. You can't use too little because you won't have the desired effect. And you need to tranquilize it to the point where it's subdued but not fallen over. Because trying to move half a ton cow on your own is not the easiest thing to do. So it's a pretty interesting sport, and you have to shoot it in the right place, just to make sure. So it's a, it's a worthy sport. I hope some of you take it up. I put this slide in here because it's moi, uh, when I'm a little bit younger, with the first of the huntsmen, um, the current type of huntsmen, with Angie and Lynn from the factory, at the old factory. And this is the first huntsman of the modern era. Huntsman's a noticeable name that Daystate's been using really since the beginning, and we've always generally kept one going. And this version we have now, which is on the right page there, is the seventh version of it, and it's the Huntsman Regal. And the stock now is made by Minelli, beautiful crafted walnut stock, and now it has a humor air regulator in it as well. So the, the Huntsman's been with us all the way through. And of course, where is the Huntsman? is behind you on the table to have a look at. By this point, uh, the company was really had been taken over by uh, Mara Marocchi, and uh, he was very excited to put investment and design into the company. And one of the projects that we brought to the table from the old day state to the new was a Wolverine project, and it started off Wolverine wasn't named after the animal, it was a lightweight wolf project. So it was Wolverine, the diminutive of wolf. And I think I showed it to Nigel Allen. Where are you, Nigel? Somewhere here, there you are. I think showed it to, you can corroborate, I showed you an uh, uh, Wolverine in 2006. Yeah. yeah. Um, so we did actually have a prototype of one really early on. But when Marrow got involved and uh, Diana Group was formed, uh, we sent that across to Italy and they developed it further. They did remarkable things with it. One of the developments was an indexing pin system developed by Steve Harper. So the brief for Steve was, Steve, I need an indexing pin that stops double loading, that costs nothing to produce and will work in electronic and day-state rifles. What, what's your ideas? 
And he went, oh, thanks. I'll have a think about it. And then we got a phone call one day and said, I woke up this morning, I've done it, you need to come up and have a look at it. And he developed the indexing system, which has one moving part, works in the electronic day states and the mechanical day states, and it's the uh, fantastic um, indexing pin system used in the Wolverine. But when we were developing it, it came up too fast. And the magazines, I think the, the maximum we ever saw out of the magazine survival rate on magazines was about 2,000 shots, and then it fell apart. And we went on for a couple of years developing this magazine, and eventually um, there was a very frustrated meeting in Italy where we said, what we'll do is we'll put it in a 303 while we're trying to sort this gremlin out. Nobody's going to fire 2,000 shots over a 303, it only does 12 shots per charge. So by the time we've got this gun in production, we'll put it in the 303 first of all, and that will slow down the usage, and then we'll see if we can fix this problem. But we've been working on it for two years at that point. And we produced the Wolverine 303, and you can see the bottom picture, top picture is the prototype, which we took to IWA, and the bottom picture is the Wolverine 303 um, production gun. 12 shots per charge, 100 foot pounds, we launched it at uh, Greystoke's Castle in, uh, in Cumbria, some of you were there, and we uh, shot a target at 100 yards, 40 millimeter target, using uh, a field target shooter to demonstrate it across a pond. He was quite miffed actually by the end of the event because he'd practiced for several weeks to make this one shot and make himself and the gun look good. And uh, we put targets out at 30, 40, 50 yards for journalists to shoot at. And of course, they wanted to have a go at the 100 meters, 100 yard target. So they did and hit it. And he was, no, don't like this. So at the end of the match, he picked the rifle up and shot it down standing yeah. and then walked away. <laughs> <laughs> so, but that was the Wolverine 303, a 303 caliber air gun, 100 foot pounds. I did by day so. But by this point, guess what? We're running out of space. So we moved four years ago to a brand new factory. <clears throat> Old building, but we gutted it and put new internals in. And this is it a couple of weeks ago. Um, the rifles all laid out, the factory, um, now the biggest factory day state's ever had, and with components coming in from sub suppliers, this is the modern way, and assembled at our premises still in Staffordshire and still six miles from Birch House Lane, and probably 30 miles from the farm where it all started. I put in a couple of other slides here. David Stook was going to be doing a presentation on the electronics, but unfortunately he's not well. So I just thought I'd put a few slides in there. You can see the uh, top left is the, um, the testing of the uh, conformal testing that we have to do for electronic emissions on electronic air guns. Yes, we have to do all that as well. And they had to do ECM testing to make sure that people with pacemakers or interference wouldn't be damaged by our air rifles. And it passed all known standards. The bottom left is the first prototype where you can see everything is in the white and one or two parts that didn't make it through to production, like the dust cap, slightly changed. But this, this is the original uh, prototype of the Pulsar. Pulsar was another element of the Wolverine, and the Pulsar really is quite interesting because it's the most expensive air rifle development that I've ever been involved in. I think when we did the Electronic Mark III, our total budget was £15,000. And I think when we come, by the time we came to Pulsar, it was over €200,000. So it quite shows the development of the company and its commitment to product over that space of time. And you can see, for those of you interested, that we've removed the side plate of the Pulsar Electronics. They're encased in a waterproof box. And then you can three, see the three capacitors, which take up less room and give us more power to feed the electronics. And the Pulsar truly was a, a revolution in itself. We did a mechanical version called the uh, Renegade. And of course, where have we got these? They're at the back for you to have a look at. Modern day state development continues. We have side lever cocking rifles, we have pressure gauges uh, in everything. We have two pressure gauges in some to show you regulator pressure. 
and we also have um, was bolt action and side lever cocking, all of which these days are ambidextrous. So we cater for left hand and right hand shooters uh, equally, and there's no price hike for buying a left hand gun at day state. And this really takes us on to really the most modern rifle of them all, the uh, Red Wolf. And we developed the Red Wolf really over the last few years, and it was launched um, late last year, early this year. And the Red Wolf takes all the electronics of the Pulsar and matches them to the Wolverine uh, mechanical system to produce a conventional layout electronic rifle. And I fair to say this is one of the most exciting rifles that we've produced, and also one of the best selling. It's just gone extremely well. Originally it was designed for a walnut stock, we did a limited edition of 200 in the series Rosso, and uh, they were uh, went out earlier this year, followed by a reverse stock version, which we thought we would put into the range just to see if anybody wanted it after the series Rosso. I think that's now 90% of the Red Wolf's sales are that stock. So very popular rifle. Uh, we, so it's about a year since it came out. We've got rid of shots at the middle part of this year, and we took a whole series of them to the extreme bench rest in Arizona uh, a couple of months ago. And it's fair to say the Red Wolf dominated of all the rifles there. Uh, in the picture you can see a number of shooters. Of note is, uh, is on the left is our champion shop, uh, whose rifle, Michael Vent, we put a replica at the back for you to have a look at and take you through. It's a 50 foot pound electronic air rifle with no cocking effort, electronic trigger, and it pretty much won everything. So please have a look at that. And that concludes my presentation on Day State. Uh, is there any questions on the history of Day State before I hand over to my uh, managing director who will take you through our special announcement? Hopefully you liked uh, that. So I found that extremely interesting to see how Day State started and it started all basically from tranquilizer darts. You know, I thought that was great and what Tony doesn't know about air rifles, yeah, it's not even worth talking about. But anyway, hopefully you liked that video. I found it personally very interesting. Uh, check out the other videos. If you're not a member here, hit that subscribe button. Leave some comments down below. Also check the video description because in there I've got my Amazon links in there where you can check out everything that I've reviewed um, in case you're interested in it as well. Um, and like I said, uh, if you haven't subscribed already, please hit that subscribe button um, and see you on the Facebook groups and uh, have a good time and I'll see you on the next video.